last few years, and of course our commentators. I will propose the following um, order of our meeting. The first of all, I will introduce Bella, but not book Bella's books because he will introduce the book by himself. And then presentation uh, uh, after presentation of the book by Bella Pokol, then two commentators, Dr. Bas Schottel from the University of Amsterdam and Dr. Michał Stambulski, University of Rotterdam and University of Zielnagura, and of course, Center for <laughs> Legal Education and Social Theory will make a comments uh, 10 minutes each and then i propose that to reply by by the author by professor bella pokol and then i will open the floor for the for the questions comments and general discussion in the end i will ask bella also to sort of the <coughs> reply to the questions and and comments and i suppose that it will take us about uh, one and a half uh, hour all this meeting so let's start maybe with the introduction of our author. So I knew Bella for many, many years, but I haven't seen him for many, many years as well. And uh, <clears throat> Professor Pockel was uh, is a, a judge of the Council Court and was elected in 2000, in June 2011, but he started his uh, job as a judge in September, 1st September 2011. He graduated from the Faculty of Law of, uh, of um, uh, utrecht Lorand University in Budapest in 1977. And in 89, he got his uh, PhD. And in 1991, he became a professor. And for since 1991, he was a head of the Department of Legal Theory and Sociology of Law at the University of Seged. And then he moved, as he told me just recently, to the, to the Budapest, the University of Budapest. He worked with Niklas Luhmann and Pierre Bourdieu. And between 1998 and 2002, he was also the member of the Hungarian parliament. And he also acted as a chairman of the Parliamentary Committee on Constitutional and Justice Matter. And I believe that because of his positions and uh, experiences he acquired in the meantime as a politician and also as a judge, that will have uh, some sort of the insight to the not only scholarly but also sort of the uh, based on the behind the curtain type of experience. And uh, since the beginning of 21st century, it means after 2001, um, Bella published several books, and the most important books, which is, I mentioned before, is a very thick tri trilogy. 1,500 pages entitled Trilogy on Social Criticism, which was published between 2004-2006. And uh, later on, he also summarized his summarized his uh, mm, research in the book, which is uh, was is entitled Medieval and Modern Jurisprudence, which I like uh, the title because it it looks that is a combination of the historical knowledge and empirical knowledge of the of the contemporary times. And then he also published in 2010 the book Authentic Theory of Law. Um, outside the publishing or writing, doing research on, uh, on um, sociology and theory of law, uh, Bella also wrote and published a book, Speculation on Moral Theory, and, uh, and also, as I see before the books which, I, which are, we are going to discuss on, on jurisprudence, he also published the book, The Last Days of Europe, The Consequences of the Demographic Collapse, which uh, I don't know the substance, but it looks like that the book is a sociological one. So, uh, as you can see, he's a prolific scholar and not only a judge. And uh, in this meeting, actually, <laughs> I would <laughs> see him as a scholar with uh, this background knowledge as judge, as politicians. I believe that we learn from his uh, reflection and insight as a scholar, politician, and the judge. And Bella, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for your invitation. It is a great honor for me, I can say. So, um, more than 40 years ago, in 1980, uh, I began working on constitutional adjudication as a young assistant professor. At that time, there were only few constitutional courts in the world. One of them was the cradle of constitutionalism in the United States, but the Supreme Court is primarily responsible for that function. This is a model that was adopted by the Supreme Court of India in the 1950s. 
in Europe at that time, Austria also had a constitutional court separate from the ordinary courts. And this model was implemented in Germany after the World War II uh, through the uh, 1949 German constitution, which was drafted by the American military authorities who occupied the defeated Germans. The American lawyer, however, attached particular importance to the fact that also democratic state power was returned to the millions of German citizens. They were not to be able to re-elect a Hitler whom the American just had, had just defeated. To this end, a constitutional court was created with unprecedented power over the majority of parliament of millions. So the Constitutional Court here was a safeguard for democracy in case the democracy of the masses of millions didn't decide as the US and the other European powers wanted. But in occupied Germany, there was no problem with the majority rule by the masses and the majority government, the democracy in the years that followed. For Germany prospered economically and the people loved the decisions of the constitutional judges who appeared in solemn robes in contrast to the slender and personal debates of the parliamentary sessions, only solemnly announced their decisions. Thus, the German model of the constitutional court created to limit the democracy and the parliamentary majority rule was later always proposed as a model of state everywhere in the world, where a new constitution and public legal system were created after the fall of dictatorship with active participation of the United States. Thus, in 1978, the model of German constitutional court was adopted in the new constitution of Spain after the Franco regime there, and after the fall of Soviet empire, the model of Ger powerful German constitutional court was also implemented in the states of Central and Eastern Europe. And since this has been theoretically substantiated, that is a new ennobled form of democracy, that is a constitutional democracy, the power of constitutional court, which actually limited the majority democracy, was further expanded, expanded in these countries. Why stop Harvey if this is the right direction? After some time, however, people in Eastern Europe began to ask, why a change of regime was needed at all after the Soviet dictatorship when now a few constitutional judges once again decide the fate of the country and not the many millions of voters. In the struggles of the elites, however, there are always elites with great economic power and media power, but they don't have the support of masses who vote in elections, and that is why the lawyer and political scientists and intellectuals they support condemn anyone who has voiced such criticism in Eastern Europe as populist. The semi-democratic, semi-juristocratic model of government that then spread uh, beyond Europe to Latin America beginning in the 1980s and through India to East Asia. Taiwan, South Korea, Thailand, Thailand, and beginning in, at the turn of millennium, Indonesia. But so far, uh, 46 states in Africa already have constitutional courts, some with U US style Supreme Court, and other with a separate German style uh, constitutional court. In many places in Africa, however, constitutional court are merely a decoration, and they were established because they were told by the European powers and the United States, which support them, that they are a necessary prerequisite for a constitutional democracy. In some countries in Latin America, Eastern Europe and East Asia, however, these constitutional courts have the strongest powers. In Latin America, Brazil and Colombia in particular are the bastion of the juristocratic state, but Mexico and Costa Rica also have strong constitutional courts, while Argentina and Chile have only a low level of constitutional uh, adjudication. In East Asia, India and Thailand have strong constitutional courts, and South Korea is second, as is Taiwan. 
as have uh, as I, I I have read the power of constitution constitutional court in Indonesia is moderately uh, strong compared to other state organs, but I, uh, I know little about it, it in detail. In Eastern Europe, the power of constitutional court is very strong because they have adopted and reinforced the already strong German model. The argument is that if this constitutionalist, which limits majority democracy, is the true to democracy, to democracy of the rule of law, why stop halfway? It should be emphasized that uh, where a strong constitutional court has been able to stabilize uh, itself over a long period of time, a dual state is slowly emerging in which the lower part of state function as a democratic state with the votes of millions of people and the upper part as a juristocratic state that is always able to overturn the decision as law of the parliamentary majority. However, this dual state gradually duplicates the political system and then the legal system too. Let's take a closer look uh, at these overlaps. More specifically, I have seen in some countries in Eastern Europe and Latin and Latin America that a parallel political system has developed around the juristocracy alongside the political system of the democracy. And it may not work uh, that way in East Asia. So that uh, what I am saying now may not apply perhaps to those countries in East Asia. Especially in Eastern European countries since the 1990s, we have seen the US global NGO networks locate their subsidiaries in these countries in Eastern Europe. At the same time, US capitalist groups have bought or established a number of business enterprises and banks here gaining economic power. Similarly, they have bought up much of the local media, newspaper and television stations, as well as book publishers, thus building intellectual power in Eastern Europe. In turn, these transplanted, transplanted global NGO networks in Eastern Europe primarily use constitutional complaints to challenge some of the majority government's laws in the constitutional courts, but also seek to achieve their political goals through litigation in ordinary courts. One could argue that justice, democracy, and parliamentary government are based on a multi-party system. Juristocracy is also based on politically motivated lawsuit by global, global net, NGO networks and enforcement of decisions through constitutional complaints. Democracy relies on parliament, their legislation and multi-party system that underlies them. Juristocracy relies on constitutional courts and other tribunals controlled by NGO networks. The constitutional judges are obliged to rule as the diehard activists of the global NGO network demand in their petitions under the whip of the global media. Otherwise, they are constantly defamed and criticized in the media as government soldier or party soldier. Party soldier. With the rise of juristocracy, however, the legal system is gradually becoming internally dualized alongside the dual political system and the dual state. This overlap can be understood by assuming that the constitution originally provided only a framework for the state and the legal system, and that constitutional aims serve only to protect the framework against legislation by majority government. It was a democratic legislator that made the substantive decisions regulating social life, and the constitution was only a sin, uh, formal framework that couldn't be violated by the parliamentary majority in the legis legislature. In the second half of the 20th century, however, the emerging constitutional courts began to interpret constitutional provision and fundamental constitutional rights broadly enough to increasingly cover different, uh, different areas of law. For example, by extending, extending the constitutional right to private property and the right to freedom of contract to all private law, Constitutional judges began to control all private law and through their decisions, 
established a constitutional private law that went beyond the traditional norm of private law. Similarly, the principle of guarantees of criminal law were incorporated into constitution, but this led the constitutional judges to begin to expand them and gradually bring all the all of con criminal law under their control. In this way, their decision gradually developed the constitutional criminal law that stands above traditional criminal law. But this also happened in labor law, family law, administrative law, financial law, and procedural law. And constitution, constitutional labor law, constitutional family law, constitutional financial law were created above these traditional branches of law, thus duplicating the legal system. And we'd like to point out that this duplication of legal system and of a comprehensive constitutional law that duplicate the legislative law <clears throat> has occurred to varying degrees in different countries. Similarly, some branches of law have remained untouched and have not received the duplicated constitutional branches of, of law over themselves. In Hungary, for example, Constitutional criminal law was most developed and the duplicated traditional and duplicated traditional criminal law because in the 1990s, a constitutional judge who was originally a criminal lawyer took it up and won a majority for it. The Hungarian constitutional judges used the argumentation formula developed by the German criminal law professors, but the constitutional judges in Germany resisted it. So the constitutional criminal law didn't prevail as strongly against the traditional criminal, criminal law there in Germany as did it in Hungary. Basically, the distinction as to when there is a duplication of branch of law by a constitutional branch of law can be formulated in such a way that on the one hand, in some countries, the principle of respective branch of law enshrined in the in, in constitution remained mere constitutional guarantees. But on the other hand, in some countries, the constitutional judges not only treated them as constitutional guarantees, but by develop, developing broad formula of argumentation, brought the entire branch of law under their control, thus gradually duplicated the rules of traditional law through their decisions. The EVO analysis shows the constitutional rules and constitutional adjudication of ind individual countries, and also the groups of university law professors, uh, have implemented the constitutionalization of traditional branches of law to varying degrees. The choice between the development, development path, whether constitutionalization in a country has stopped at the mere constitutional guarantees or continued in the direction of the full constitutionalization of traditional legal branches depended firstly on the content of the actual constitutional rules in the country, Second, on what attitude the majority of constitutional judges had, had in this regard. And last but not least, what strategy was chosen within the traditional legal areas by the group of university law professors in the country. In other words, it is worth analytically separating the two levels of constitutionalization and why constitutionalization that is limited to mere constitutional guarantees, it can be classified as a lower level, uh, if forced to fully constitutionalize the traditional branch of law should be analyzed separately. The actors in this regard are firstly the constitutional making power when drafting the constitutional text, secondly, the majority of constitutional judges, and finally, the academic, academic jurist groups in each traditional branch, legal branch. But in a broader perspective, a role is also played by the legal theorists and the philosophers in this field. In this field. With these analytical divisions, the, the situation of constitutionalization described above can be viewed as a single picture. It can be established that in the case of the two main areas of legal system, private law and criminal law, there have been countries where constitutionalization has remained with constitutional guarantees, while there have been cases where full constitutionalization for one or more branches of law could be seen.
In these two branches of law, private law and criminal law, one could well highlight the dividing, dividing line, the crossing of which decided whether a lower or a higher level, level of constitutionalization was intended. In the case, case of private law, this was the consideration of the consideration of the horizontal effect, when not only the vertical effect of fundamental rights between state and private parties were recognized, but also the possibility of integrating fundamental constitutional rights into privately relations. This recognition was even reinforced by accepting not only the indirect horizontal effect, which was limited to the judicial interpretation of private law alone, but also the direct one when private law was, was pushed aside. And uh, the result of this put between private party was decided solely on the basis of fundamental rights, fundamental rights. In the criminal law, in case of criminal law, the crossing of the dividing line and the full constitutionalization of criminal law beyond mere, beyond mere, mere constitutional guarantees will be realized if the Ultima ratio principle or the principle to be supported by legal interest or any other princi similar principle elabor elaborated in the legal literature in the criminal law are made standard of the rule of law and all facts of criminal law can be reviewed according to this by the constitutional judges. Proceeding from the mildest level of constitutionalization to the strongest, the United States should be mentioned first. In case of private law, the horizontal effect was only, uh, little, uh, only little recognized with the state action doctrine in the United States, and it has had an in effect only on the enforceability of private contract that violates the fundamental rights. The constitutionalization of criminal law in the United States, uh, but remained at a level that was limited to mere constitutional guarantees and no, no full constitutionalization was, was intended here, as could be seen from criticism of, from, of some uh, US criminal law professors. Who wanted this? <laughs> Who wanted this? In the same way, a reluctance in the areas of labor law and financial law by the Supreme judges about the freedom of democratic legislation in this area of law could be seen. Moving further towards strengthening constitutionalization, the overview can continue with, with the British Supreme Court, which recently recognized the indirect uh, horizontal impact in private law. Although it is not possible, it is not possible to know how the situation will develop after Brexit, uh, since the horizontal effect of fundamental rights is contrary to the is contrary to the traditional traditional English law, and Brexit itself was provoked by such influences of the EU. The effects of fundamental rights on private law uh, are stronger in Germany, where um, they have recently had a direct effect. Uh, and in the field of criminal, but in the field of criminal law, the constitutionalization in Germany has stopped at the efforts, uh, stopped at the level of mere criminal law constitutional guarantees. The most radical efforts in German criminal law for expansion, expansion, expansion of constitutionalization to the entire criminal law were expressed by some groups of criminal German criminal criminal law professors. And these efforts couldn't influence, uh, uh, but the constitutional adjudication in Germany, in Canada. The constitutionalization in the area of private law hasn't reached the level of sin in the case of Germany, but it has exceeded Germany in the area of criminal law, and they tend through a conjunction of prim principle of harm and the principle of proportionality toward the complete constitutionalization of the criminal law. A final question uh, to ask is, what is the effect on the duplication of law if constitutional adjudication is seen by the Supreme Court in context of the ordinary courts or vice versa if it seen by judges of constitutional court separate from the ordinary courts, ordinary courts. 
with regards to the relationship between do constitutional dogmatics and the traditional dogmatics of legal branches, a distinction must be made between two types of between the two types of constitutional adjudication. One is that the separate constitutional courts, while the other is the based on the American model, where it is carried out by the ordinary courts. In the later case, judges, judges with decades of experience in traditional justice also perf perform the function of constitutional adjudication so that constitutional provisions, principles, and declarations that have been added to legal one, even if they are more abstract, remain united with the traditional law. And in this way, the traditional legal system doesn't become that much doubled. Likewise, constitutional dogmatics based on new, more abstract constitutional provisions remain more closely integrated within this framework of traditional legal thinking. Within this framework, traditional dogmatic concepts themselves are, of course, more politicized because of a broader interpretation of open constitutional principles principle and declarations. This politicization, politicization makes clearer the proximity of individual dogmatic alternatives to one uh, or other world of political values. The price of a more uniform legal system is therefore that the entire legal system is more, is more strongly politicized, but in the case of a separate constitutional court, a politically neutral legal legal dogmatics of the traditional legislative branches of law remains largely unaffected alongside the thoroughly politicized constitutional dogmatics. Indeed, it is uh, the constitutional court separate from the ordinary courts that opens the way for a more complete duplication of the legal system. If, in particular, if the positions of the, of the constitutional judges are filled by legal professors, this is increased, and this is usually the case with the separate constitutional courts. In these cases, the role of political values extends of the individual constitutional judges and their effect, direct effect on the interpretation of constitutional provisions, provisions principle of declaration, is more pronounced. In addition, constitutional judges often extend their power of changing the legislative standards and, on the other hand, there are always legal professors in traditional branches of law who move away from their humble dogmatic role in legislative law and turn to constitutional criminal law, constitutional private law, and so on. In this way, these university professors can formulate their dogmatic pro proposals no longer as modest de legal ferenda alternatives, but as hierarchically higher mandatory constitutional demands. There are already examples of this in Hungary. However, this has been mostly observed among the Germans since the 1980s. In the field of criminal law, for example, Klaus Roxin's initiatives have increasing, increasingly started to, re, to view the freedom of legislation and criminal law re, regulation as limited uh, by constitutional criminal law, and the focus shifted from traditional criminal law onto to the constitutional barriers of the state power. These restrictions are set by professor of criminal law themselves, and so they are actually trying to scrutinize legislation instead of making the earlier more humble proposals. For this uh, to succeed, this is, of course, a prerequisite to have a majority within a constitutional code that is, that is open the demands of the constitutional criminal law prepared accordingly to political premises dictated from outside. Thank you uh, for your attention. It, it was a, a short introduction to my book. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bella. Uh, as you could as you listen, actually, there is a different approach to the juristocracy. It's not a question only of the judicial activism on the network of uh, judges, inter internal or international, as pulled by Hirschel, let's say, by Alex Wickstone in his work, but and uh, and recently actually also by Christina Parau, uh, <clears throat> but is uh, 
quite different attitude, which is connected with the structural changes in law due to the activity of, uh, of constitutional courts. And now I will ask our two commentators, and uh, I propose in the such order, the first, uh, Dr. Uh, Bas, and, uh, and the second, Michal. Okay, so Bas, okay. the floor is yours. Yes, um, I really thank the author for discussing his book uh, with us in person. Uh, I think I should clarify three points in advance. Firstly, I must admit that I have not read his book in its entirety. Secondly, at times I found it difficult to follow the argumentation. And thirdly, at various places, the book suggests that there is a kind of leftist liberal movement powered by Inter Alia, the Soros organization, that is deliberately undermining democratic governance in various Central Eastern European countries. Personally, I find these suggestions, suggestions scientifically flawed and politically dangerous. And I want my, the author and also the, um, the, um, the audience to know that these three aspects may have resulted in me not giving the book uh, the most fair and charitable reading. So in order to ensure that the author is at least fully aware of how I understood his book, I briefly restate some of its central tenets. So my reading of, the cent of some of the central tenets of the book is as follows. The author argues that increasingly jurists, through the voice of judges, determine the content of the law at the expense of the normal statutory legislator. According to the author, the statutory legislator represents the will of millions of people, i.e. the demos. And when the content of the law is not any longer ultimately and largely determined by the legislator, but by jurists and judges, we have a new form of governance, namely juristocracy. As I understand the book, the author does not deny that judges must interpret legal norms and therefore partially determine the content of law. So the author seems to accept that when judges apply and speak the law, the meaning of the legal norms do not follow automatically from the text of the statute. So the author acknowledges that applying the law involves legal interpretation. The author also seems to accept that when interpreting the law, the judges must be guided by and take into account case law, legal principles and legal doctrine. In other words, the author accepts that law is more than legislation. Yes, quite but, sure. Sorry? Quite sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> But the author takes issue with a particular form of legal interpretation by the judiciary, namely the constitutional review of legal norms from the normal branches of law, for example, civil law or what he calls uh, private law or criminal law. He distinguishes between two types of constitutional review, pure constitutional law review and fundamental rights review. The former pertains to checking whether the various branches legislator, judiciary, executive, and levels, federal versus state, national, provincial, municipal, of government, acted within the competence conferred on them in the constitution. This type of constitutional review is not considered problematic by the author. It's not really a form of juristocracy, or not in the problematic sense. The latter form of constitutional review is problematic and constitutes juristocracy, so namely the fundamental rights review because fundamental rights review checks and revises the material content of legal norms of the normal branches of law. So rather than simply checking whether a branch of law of government was competent to enact a particular legal norm, the judges now check and revise the content of the legal norm for compliance with fundamental rights. The most extreme form of fundamental rights review is the one conducted by special constitutional courts. The judges of these specialist, specialized courts are not embedded in the legal practice of the normal legal domains of, for example, private and criminal law, but they intervene from an outside, from outside the normal law and adopt a purely fundamental rights perspective. Also, according to the author, the special constitutional courts have a tendency to develop a kind of juristic bureaucracy that is staffed by jurists who have uncritically adopted a leftist leftist liberal human rights discourse 
as taught in academia and propagated by progressive civil society organizations. The staff jurists prepare the judgments for the constitutional judge, de facto affecting the independence of the judge and disabling them to respect the letter of the constitution and statutory law. By contrast, when judicial review, a constitutional review is in the hands of ordinary lower courts, there is less risk of such extreme form of juristocracy. For the lower court judges are still embedded in the practice of the normal law. There is in terms of the author less duplication of the legal regime. The author thus takes issue with how jurists and judges indirectly and directly transform the content of the normal branches of law through fundamental rights. Especially problematic in the eyes of the author is when jurists change the content of statutory law in the name of fundamental rights. I have two types of questions. One type of question would be about what, according to the uh, author, is the legal status of fundamental rights. So what is, in your view, uh, the relationship between fundamental rights and normal branches of law. Um, is it okay if I share the questions on uh, on the slides? Um, I guess so. Yes. Sure. Do it. Sure. Let's do it. Um, blah, 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 slide show. Voila. So, can you see them? Yes. Okay. Yes. I can see. You just have to see them and you don't have to like them. Um, so do fundamental rights apply to the normal branches of law? I guess the answer would be yes. But do fundamental rights also take priority over statutory law? And if fundamental rights do not apply to normal law, what are then the function and legal status of fundamental rights according to the author? Or maybe where do fundamental rights or constitutional guarantees stop and where does then juristocracy and legal duplication begin? Um, and these are actually maybe could be considered as critical questions, but they also could actually be considered as questions for clarification of clarification. Then secondly, questions about the democratic character of fundamental rights. Now in the European context, fundamental rights are laid down in constitutions and, lead, and regional treaties. So uh, you put Convention of human rights, the Lisbon Treaty, um, making the European Chart of Fundamental Rights into law. And these constitutions and treaties also provide for the judicial review and remedies in order to guarantee the fundamental rights. The constitution and the treaties have been adopted and recognized by the member states through democratic processes and often requiring a larger major majority than normal statutory law. So here's my question. If, according to the author, normal statutory legislation is presumably an expression of the will of millions of people, why are fundamental rights and the judicial protection of fundamental rights not equally an expression of the will of millions of people? That's it. Thanks, Bas. And now I will ask uh, <clears throat> Dr. Michał Stambulski to make his comments and questions. Shall I stop the sharing of the PowerPoint, maybe? Yes, please yeah. do. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Professor Pokol, for the book and for the introduction for today's meeting. Um, I must say that um, maybe I will start with the personal reflection. I was trained as a Polish lawyer, and during that time um, I was trained in this kind of respect towards the con Polish constitutional court, even in the atmosphere of this kind of what I would call even sacralization of the constitutional court, having assumption that based on the assumption that the constitutional court has some kind of special relation with the constitution, which is also epistemic that the constitutional court has the special authority on the interpretation of the constitution and in the in this as a consequence the constitutional court cannot be wrong after reading this book i think for this type of um, education of this type of attitudes i think it's a very un, um, it's a very um, unconvenient book by professor pokol because it it poses a great challenge toward this type of thinking and this type of sacralization now in poland we observe the 
reverse process of desacralization of the constitutional court in the last couple of years. So uh, I think this book also poses a very big and very serious challenge towards the mainstream of the constitutional law or constitutional law theory in general. And uh, I might say that it's something very striking for me that if we will think that before the second, first world war, there was only two countries in the world that had constitutional review, United States and Norway, when the constitutional review were, were established as a, um, as a precedent, not by some kind of act, but rather by a development inside of the courts themselves. And now we have more than 80 constitutional courts around the world. So we have 100 teams with this kind of development. And I think what this book does right is to challenge this kind of development from the point of view of the new type of governance. Something from the lawyers like myself trained this kind of respect over this new type of governance is never questioned or it's not so questioned maybe as it should be. And this book does exactly right. Exactly, exactly that. If we think about um, this process was connected with the development of constitutional judiciary in the last 100 years, uh, it's often described as the process of politicization of judiciary and also juridification of the politics. And to, when we think now about the spaces of the problems in which constitutional courts in general and, and also high courts in, around the world uh, face, we can identify several issues, like, for example, impeachment procedures, which are also some kind of judicial review of the acts of the politician and uh, also the um, electoral decisions. So validity of election is also something that around the world high courts do often. We also have the crimes against humanity and universal jurisdiction. So something which was previously reserved towards foreign policies becomes more and more often um, problem of the judiciary. And also we have the, the problem of the rights uh, themselves, which um, Bas already mentioned in his comment. And we have this post raw and weight type of thinking about the controversial judicial decision regulating the problems which was again reserved typically for the politics before this development of the constitutional judiciary. I would also add here the new development, the rule of law issues and the structure of judiciary when the structure of the constitutional design of the country itself becoming less and less the typical democratic political issue and becomes something more and more connected with the, with the decision of the judiciary, some kind of vision of the rule of law and some kind of connection with this would be this kind of theoretical development of so-called doctrine of the unconstitutional constitutional amendments. So even if you would imagine some kind of majority of the parliament that would formally um, gave some kind of constitutional amendment, there's a theoretical argument saying that those amendments, if they will be against the core of the values of the constitutionalism, would be unconstitutional themselves. So there would be probably some kind of constitutional court that would have the right to declare constitutional amendment as unconstitutional. And this development raises uh, two issues identified in Professor Pockel's uh, book. Uh, first would be the democratic deficit, simply, and this kind of organizational aspect of the, of the issue, of this kind of constitutional judiciary. And here I have two quotes. The constitutional court in this extended form are not only a means of protection over the constitutional activities of the state organ, but also a new place for the creation of basic state decision, which has been wholly or partly removed from the democratic bodies elected by the millions of people. Another quote, the decision making of the constitutional court is completely behind the public. And while it is acceptable in the case of ordinary courts, it cannot be tolerated in the case of the constitutional courts whose basic state decisions are made on the basis of their free discretion. So we have this kind of democratic deficit argument in the book that the constitutional judiciary is not democratic. It's something that goes behind the shadows and there is no legitimacy. What I found interesting in this book or those fragments I think I would connect with with the experience of the author as a constitutional judge, and those um, arguments connected with this kind of um, behind the scene of mechanism of the functioning of the constitutional court, like the role of the clerks, 
which are becoming more and more popular, more and more influential, especially on the new judges who don't have the experience and are, I understand this argument that they are some kind of the depositaries of this kind of institutional memory of the constitutional court because judges change, but the clerks are mostly the same and the role is something very important in decision making and here again we have this argument from the democratic deficit as long we can think about constitutional um, judges as being elected so there is some kind of democratic process behind it as the constitutional clerks they are not so openly they are not involved in any political process at all and also what was, was very interesting in this argumentation was the role of the um, ways of assigning particular cases to the particular judges, which is so, also something in the discretion of the most of the cases constitutional court president and by simply electing the rapporteur, so somebody who makes the decision in the first instance, it's, it's a possibility to influencing the case and influencing the constitutional design of the country in the, again, this kind of non-democratic, non-political way. Uh, so this is the first argument, the lack of democratic legitimacy. But what I found here more important, because this is something that we hear in the literature from some time, Adam Chanota mentioned Alex uh, Sweetstone or Ran Hirsch and those books like, like 20 years ago, there was this wave of this kind of books on the juristocracy and the, the term was coined, I think, during that time. So this is the refreshing of this kind of argument. But what I found even more interesting is this kind of epistemic part of this of the story uh, because according to uh, professor pokol um, and what he said already in, in his introductionary remarks development of this institutional design is also connected with the, this kind of epistemic development of some kind of knowledge about the constitution the constitutional law and this knowledge and develop these networks and I, again i have a quote here uh, this includes setting up a network of constitutional law teacher international lawyers and legal theorists from different countries organized by the global foundations networks the permanent participants in these networks regularly consult each other at conferences and then summarize the proposed constitutional interpretation and formulas of the profession in english language books so this design requires some kind of knowledge which is also a second way of i think uh, addressing this kind of legitim democratic legitimacy gap. If we say something, this is based on scientific knowledge, then we don't need to address this democratic uh, deficiencies. But the problem is, according to Professor Pokol, which I found very interesting, and I'm very curious to learn how other justices from the bench of the Hungarian Constitutional um, Court see this kind of argument, because this argument says that there is no this type of knowledge. At the end, there is simple discretion in interpretation of fundamental rights. So addressing now one of the best question, I would say that the it's not only about the fundamental rights. The story is that there is always something more attached, some kind of discretionary power connected with the interpretation of fundamental rights that goes beyond the typical legal doctrine and has this kind of political aspect in it. So at the end, there is no scientific or this kind of dogmatic procedure identifying the meaning of the Constitution. As at least I under as I understand this kind of argument, so the this kind of scientific knowledge, the constitutional law doctrine, could be seen a little bit as an ideology. That is, its function is simply to hide this mechanism of discretionary me, discretionary power making of decision of this basic structure of the state. And now I would like to formulate two, two questions for the author. Um, why I was reading the book, it was a little bit not clear to me entirely what was the entity behind the juristocracy described in the book. Can we identify which group whose interests are realized by the juristocracy? This text of the book seems to suggest that the judges themselves and this kind of network of international scholars are, the driving, are in the driving seat here, but is it really the case? Because from, again, Polish point of view, uh, it is a little bit seems to me that the political system itself is interested in having juristocracy because having juristocracy of this kind of type allows the politicians uh, to make the decisions but not having the responsibility because it can the decision from the political system can be sent to the constitutional court and the constitutional court takes the blame 
and the politician can say it's not us it was the law itself so who is what are the groups interested so it would be this kind of sociological question what are the groups behind juristocracy are there only those judges and international scholars or can we add to the mix also the political system and the politician themselves and my second question would be uh, it would concern the possibility uh, of reform of the system. The author's analyst seems to be very critical to the phenomenon of juristocracy, but when somebody makes this kind of criticism, the question always arises about viable alternatives. So what can we identify some kind of directions of the reform to limit the scope of juristocracy? And would it be, for example, some kind of institutional reform, like having the constitutional court, not the final word of having the parliament's the power to overrule the constitutional court decision? Or would it be also connected with some kind of um, intervention at the level of legal theory? So some kind of more developed doctrine of restraint of adjudication of judicial Restraint. So that would be my two questions. What are the this kind of sociological groups behind juristocracy that um, juristocracy somehow address? And the second, what are the possible directions of the reform in order to restrain juristocracy? Thank you very much. Thanks both, Pas and Michal. Uh, as you see, Bella, they are very serious, actually, questions, right? And serious comments, it seems to me, from two angles so uh, please address the comments and questions yes yes <laughs> thank you thank you very much so I, I i received a question from the two invited commentators in advance uh, and um, I, I i tried to answer briefly so <laughs> by uh, by uh, i think that the the, the two question I, I saw that it is for it was from by by um it was by uh, Stambolski. So I begin with the, with you with with uh, Stambolski uh, uh, the answer. The first question was, uh, Mr. Stambolski, about the role of political power groups in the emergence of the aristocracy at the expense of the democracy. He also doubts that this system came to, came into being as a result of the political activity of the judiciary which enforced the judiciary through its decision. I fully agree with him. I fully ag agree with him. The judges who ultimately make a juristocracy a reality occupy this role only in state where it occurs, but nowhere where they were, nowhere where they, nowhere were they the driving force you know, in its creation, in its creation. Uh, uh, However, it is due to the political reason that vary from, from, from country to country, and it is difficult to provide a general explanation. Uh, a general explanation. For example, in his book Toa Juristocracy, uh, uh, the Canadian, Canadian political scientist Ren Hirsch uh, analyzes four countries where the state, super, state supremacy of parliament was deliberately replaced by the supremacy of the Supreme Court or the Constitutional Court by the dominant party leaders of the, that time. Uh, his reason that the political groups that dominated the state through parliamentary supremacy were beginning to lose their dominance due to changes in the electorate. This situation was the cause that the state supremacy could be transferred to the Supreme Court or the Constitutional Court before the old political elite was completely over when the, the political values and view became dominant in the judiciary, in Israel, in New Zealand, Canada, in Canada, and in, in South Africa. Yeah, in my book, I also discuss a number of other countries where different reasons play the role in the development of juristocracy. But uh, Mr. Stambos is right, because nowhere was the internal political active of the, ju of the judiciary uh, the cause of the emergence of the juristocracy. You are right. Uh, the second question of Mr. Mr. Stambowski refers to the possibilities of reforms 
to eliminate the distortions, uh, the, uh, to dismantle the aristocracy and to restore the, restore the democratic structures. My book contains several analyses in this regard, the sense of which is that the original, origin, original idea of the constitutional adjudication must be restored and that the constitutional court can only be the guardian of the political change economy of a democracy. Uh, this change would entail that the material social issues would always have to be regulated by the parliamentary majority and its government in parliamentary law. In my view, fundamental social decisions are now determined to too great an extent by the constitutional court and the constitutional uh, or the Supreme Court in the individual country. Uh, as for the uh, question of uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Sch Schottel, uh, uh, he asked four questions. The first three uh, concern the relationship between fundamental rights and the traditional legislative law. And the fourth question concerns the democratic nature of the fundamental rights. So the first question my commentator asks is that the fundamental rights applies to traditional branches of law. And my answer is yes. In German legal theory, the dual and hierarchical relationship between simple law and constitutional law has been postulated in this regard. Uh, and in my, in my book, I analyze the studies of Robert Alexi, among others, to illustrate this. I have reformulated uh, this so that I understand it more generally as a doubling of legal system, doubling of legal system, and the whole second part of my book deals with that problem, with this. Uh, Mr. Uh, Schottel's next question is whether fundamental rights take precedence over traditional statutory law. My answer is that as thing, things stand, they do. And for the Alexis and the others, they mean the primacy of fundamental rights over ordinary law. And for me, it means the primacy of constitutional law over the lower legislative law of the dual legal system. In my view, however, it is no longer just a not, not just one branch of law among others, but a new level of in the entire legal system, constitutional law above legislative law. Uh, the third question is, if fundamental rights didn't apply to the traditional branches of law, what role would they have? My answer is, if they were to go back to original idea of constitutional adjudication, it, uh, and it was only a matter, a matter uh, of sec securing a framework of democracy, then the fundamental rights would only be the guidelines for the democratic legislator, but their content and details would always be determined by the legislative majority, occasionally by qualified majority. But that is only my academic view, and in the, the reality is different. My uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Schotter's fourth question is really uh, more an assertion. Since, fund, uh, 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 more, uh, since fundamental rights are contained in state constitutions and international human rights con convention adopted by in democratic forms. So it is a contradiction, he says, it is a contradiction that I do not see them as a part of democracy, uh, democracy, uh, but uh, as a basis of a juristocracy. Let me begin, let me begin in my response with Carl Schmitt, thesis of the tyranny of values. This means that values and abstract constitutional declaration by claiming absolute validity, valid, valid, validity always steer action in opposite direction in a given situation. In other words, they can only ever be implemented in reality with compromise by claiming absolute validity for themselves. To come to the answer, individual fundament, fundamental rights can only ever point in a general direction, but in individual legal dis disputes, they can only ever be used with compromise to derive and create legal norms. And that is what the constitutional judges and Supreme Court judges do, and they are hardly constrained by the text of the Constitution and the Convention on the Human Rights. 
uh, human right by, by which, by the way, uh, was adopted in a truly democratic ma manner. Therefore, it becomes a juristocracy in a distortion of democracy. It is my answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, this meeting actually is an inaugural meeting of a, you know, a readers meet author, and it's grow out out of a reading group which was set up during the middle of a, of a lockdown, which I am proud of. Right, it's sort of the of the not my baby, but baby of uh, Michał Stambulski and myself, and but. Uh, Having said that, at the same time, this meeting is also the meeting within the research project on the epistemic uh, <coughs> authority of, of lawyers. And the one question which you, Bella, didn't answer was a question which is important from this second part. It means epistemic authority of lawyers, the question of the, of the epistemic authority of the constitutional judges. It means the decision which Michał Stambulski asked you was is taken within discretion or is based on the some special type of knowledge. Yeah, but I can, I can uh, yeah, yeah, this is my, uh, that is, I am, uh, I, uh, during the last 10 years, I am a constitutional judge. Uh, earlier, I was a researcher of the constitutional education during the last 30 years, I was always, uh, one of my topics was the constitutional education, but during the last 10 years, I am personally a constitutional judge, and, and uh, 300, 3,000 or 5,000 uh, decisions I made personally. <laughs> Uh, so there is a problem I, I, I could see, and, and there was no writing in Hungary, in Hungarian literature, this problem. And I could, could, uh, could understand if I became a uh, constitutional judge, and I could see uh, the problem. So the constitutional judge, I was elected, and uh, um, in the next day, I have to, uh, I have to, uh, to vote in the, uh, the constitutional court, in the body. Early in the morning, private law, then a, a private law, then a criminal law uh, problem, then a labor law problem, then an, um, an international law problem, and in the in the evening there was a social um, a social security problem. But uh, and all the constitutional judges had the problem. Why? Why the constitutional adjudication is a general. Uh, the constitutional uh, constitutional uh, 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 core, uh, constitutional judge is a generalist. Generalist. The American, the United States judges are generalist. All the all the judges have uh, in the morning in the morning private law, then criminal law also also. In the Europe, not there was two hundred. Uh, to, uh, for a uh, hundred years ago, 150 years ago, it began a, a, a specialization. And now, the, the more, all the judges, when uh, the judges uh, step by step, uh, higher and higher, the specialization is, is even growing. Is in, grow. And there is, in, in, in the Supreme Court in, in, in Hungary, Poland, and so on, if I am Supreme Court judges, I am all a, a criminal, not only criminal uh, judge, criminal law judges, so, or judges for for the for the uh, life problem, for for uh, for life for uh, uh, criminal law uh, judges for 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 a proprietary problem, uh, so on, and and uh, and uh, in the in the United States, there are gen all judges are generalist judge, and the constitutional judges all are generalist judge, but the problem is that. Here in Europe, all the judges and all the professor. Hello, the professor. Uh, we are, we were in the uni in the in the university law students, a generalist, <laughs> a generalist after after the after the graduation. But uh, and, and began uh, the law the lawyer began to work and became a specialization. It, it is a specialization. And as the problem, all the all the jurists in Europe are special specialist Europe, but 
The constitutional judges <laughs> must be generalists. It is the greatest problem. Very pro it is a great problem. All the, ja all the he very famous professor, professor for a criminal law or the private law, or and so, but uh, uh, when, when a professor became a considered judge, all the day must, must decide private law and so, and he has no law knowledge. No, this is the problem. That's the reason why the clerk, clerk became became more and more the real real decision the the decision making proce process process um, proceeding in europe i could i could uh, analyze this problem in romania uh, in, in uh, slovakia and so on so all the, uh, there is in in every every country there is a problem this generalist problem is the growth, greatest problem that's the reason why the U constitutional judges uh, is not the possibility to uh, to decide the clerk the clerk uh, <laughs> the wissenschaftler arbeiter mitarbeiter in deutschland in deutsch the wissenschaftler mitarbeiter can can uh, can uh, um, uh, who are uh, who uh, who work there uh, 10 years ago, 10, during 10 years, and, and the new constitution just come, he's very famous in private law or criminal also, but not a, not a generalist. That's the problem. So uh, that's the, the, there, there are a lot of distortions, you know, in, a, uh, in, in, every, in every country in Europe, there is a, dis, a lot of distortion. One of the cause is this, this problem, the generalized problem. So the epistemic, epistemic problem, the, the, the knowledge of the constitution, that this generalized problem in a special, specialized, uh, specialized legal world in Europe. And United States, there is a generalized judge, the, 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 uh, it is the, you know, the uh, the rule the rule so one one answer in my book i i deal with this problem a lot of, in a lot of pages in a lot of pages and uh, during the last 10 years i i know in personally personally that that is a great problem the greatest problem in the in the decision making mechanism of the in the in the constitutional courts thank you very much so it looks like that is not only juristocracy but clericocracy Cleric, cleric, cleric. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and, uh, thanks very much, uh, Bella and uh, commentators. Uh, now I open the floor for the general questions and uh, and comments. If you want to say something, just uh, you know, uh, 